So moving on to another form of nihilism, we encounter moral nihilism. What is moral nihilism? This is undoubtedly the most touchy and most controversial material within all forms of nihilism. Moral nihilism is the meta-ethical view that nothing is intrinsically moral or immoral, that there is no right or wrong, and that morality is a construct of laws and codes that may be applicable to individual adherents, but otherwise have no universal or even relative truth. So what to make of these assertions? Well, it does seem to be a degeneration of sorts to arrive at this kind of conclusion. Just because there isn't any kind of objective truth to morality, that is to say, a morality that would be in place independent of sentient life, doesn't mean that there still cannot be a universal morality relative to sentience. I would say yes, there are factors supporting moral relativism. Some rights and wrongs vary from culture to culture, and maybe even from individual to individual to a certain extent. And to some degree there could be said to be a moral universalism, that is, certain principles that can be considered right or wrong for everyone everywhere. But these are just general ideas painted with a very broad brush. So to really get to the meat of the matter and clear away a lot of faulty misconceptions, these ideological proposals need to be parsed and perhaps brought to some sort of ubiquitous conclusion. First, it's probably fitting to point out that if morality is indeed anything, that it is an exclusively intrinsic factor. There isn't any morality to be found out there existing independently of sentience. In other words, there isn't an extrinsic component to morality. No God out there that has laid down a rule book no feature of the universe that has any absolute moral bearing before the advent of a subject. Morality can only be morality as per its relativity to a subject. Indeed, morality would be meaningless and without application, without a sentient subject to apply unto. So, by what measuring stick is morality established? The most common instinctive response is to say that it has to do with suffering and applied harm. But if we analyze this contention a little closer, we can see that this is not necessarily always the case. Nor is it even close to something resembling a universal ethic. Moral relativism shows us this. The values of seeking or avoiding pain, harm, and suffering vary not only from culture to culture, but even from individual to individual. Harm, pain, and suffering in and of themselves do not constitute a moral violation if the subjects that these stimuluses are applied to don't concur. You cannot rightly say that whipping someone is morally wrong if that person wants to be whipped. The masochist is a good example of such. And whether or not you decide to dismiss a masochist as an illness or not doesn't really matter as to the raw facts. To each his own. It may not float your boat but your disagreement with it is merely an opinion. Just as someone who thinks pain is pleasurable has their own opinion about it. To inject a moral principle into this subjective matter would be to force 
an opinion onto someone who disagrees. Now that is morally wrong. It's not up to you to decide what's best or what's right or wrong for another person. Each individual can decide this for themselves and it needn't go any further than this as long as each individual is making the decision only for themselves or for someone in their care incapable of making a mature sound decision. In these specific cases, wherein individuals are not in a position to make certain choices or not mature enough to be completely independent, such as the case with children, the elderly, or people with varying mental and physical disabilities, a utilitarian approach would be sufficient. But if the reduction of harm, pain, and suffering isn't the fundamental basis on which to construct a universal morality, then what is? Well, the key lies in that which was used to clarify the ungrounded moral assumption of reducing harm, pain, and suffering. Choice. What else could it be? If different cultures and different individuals have different preferences concerning certain practices, then morality cannot be grounded in trying to judge the right or wrong of practices, as long as those practices are chosen by all who are involved. This idea would be the closest thing to a moral universalism that could be conceived, and it doesn't leave any wiggle room. Do you or do you not give permission to whatever X-factor practice is being applied to your person or to the belongings held in your care? Now I say to the belongings held in your care because it gets a little tricky and sticky when it comes to what's called personal or public property. What you do with your own body and mind is your own decision, for a body and mind are the autonomy of an individual, and no one can claim ownership of such without the use of force against free will, unless of course one grants such permission. But even with such permission granted, the ownership should not last longer a duration than the individual deciding to withdraw consent. But public or personal property is a different matter and is not as easily resolved. That is a whole topic unto itself and should be reserved for another time in perhaps a future video. Today we'll stick to discussing morality only as it applies to individuals. So it's not up to anyone to decide what's right or wrong or what's best or worse for any other individual, despite certain assumptions that seem to make sense or to support commonly held values. What's most morally important is the autonomy of free will. As long as your autonomy of free will is not used to violate the autonomy of free will of another. It's pretty simple. We've all heard of the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But this assumes that others would want for themselves what you choose for yourself. It's presumptuous and not very mindful. So, with this in mind, I propose an update to the Golden Rule. The Golden Rule 2.0. Don't do unto others anything unless you have their permission first. A freely extended courtesy is one thing. It can be accepted or rejected freely. But the suggestion to do something to another implies a directed action done without permission that may or may not be agreeable to the target. So taking out the right and wrong of any circumstance or practice 
and resting the morality of these conditions solely on whether or not the subject consents to the circumstances or practice produces a moral relativistic universalism. No one wants to be victimized unless one gives their permission for such a victimization. This is true of all sentience. It's an absolute ethical principle of all subjects, whether or not they are even consciously aware of it. All crimes or violations of moral law or trespasses of approbation, theft, deception, rape, and murder are all offenses against the free will. Whatever one chooses for themselves, however, as long as it isn't a wrongdoing against someone else's free will, could be said to be morally correct. Now this is where some might say that people consent to all sorts of counterproductive things due to sheer ignorance or malevolent deception. So how does this wash against the idea that morality is found with granted permission? Well, it's not up to you to force something upon someone else, even if they are ignorant and you think you know better than them. Everyone should have the freedom to make their own mistakes and learn from them, even if it means they will experience harm. You can do everything you can to help. Just don't apply force. And as for someone giving permission due to deception, this in itself is a violation of someone's permission. If permission is granted under false pretenses, the moral wrong is found with the deceiver. This can be corrected through morally correct behavior and actions, that is, the disclosure of the deceit to the deceived, and the free will for the deceived to have the information and make new choices as per necessary. So moral nihilism that has been represented to mean that nothing is morally wrong is faulty. We are existentially aware, and morality is indeed relative and subjective to the context of existential sentience. But that doesn't mean that since it's all relative and subjective that it doesn't exist. To say such would be to deny existentiality which is foolish and false due to the prerequisite of having to have an existence to assert such a denial. It's all made up, yes, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have momentary existential applicability. It could be argued that the free will of existentiality is its foundational instrumentation so any proposed morality would have to have its roots grounded in this agency. Morality is not a feature of any world. And this is the problem when it comes to error theory. The three principles of error theory are, one, there are no moral features in this world. Nothing is right or wrong. Two, Therefore, no moral judgments are true. However, three, our sincere moral judgments try but always fail to describe the moral features of things. These principles are based on the false premise that there can be no moral truth. But perhaps this is because the error theory nihilists were looking in the wrong place. The moral feature in question is found within sentience itself, not as an externalized material item of any world. The moral truth isn't a feature of a thing. There is no thing. Moral truths have to do with the free will of existential awareness. To use force against a free will is wrong 
unless such force is being used to stop force from being used against free will. That's why a killing might not necessarily be morally right or wrong, depending on the moral particulars of the situation. To kill someone who is innocent just for fun or for monetary gain is obviously immoral. But to kill someone who is in the process of killing another for fun or monetary gain is not wrong, and perhaps even morally correct. Based on the freedom of free will and the choice of how to utilize free will, moral judgments and moral ethics can be established. There is no failure in identifying, judging, and describing morality in these terms. The moral truth lies with the existential free will. This is a truth that knowledge can be built on and thus values based on these aspects established. The error theory fails to make its case for error. Global falsity. Perhaps moral beliefs and assertions are false and that they claim that certain moral facts exist that in fact do not exist because there are no moral properties that are intrinsically motivating. Now, what kind of a soul-dead zombie would make such an argument? Are you saying you can't recognize your own awareness and how that awareness doesn't want to be victimized against its will? Having your head bashed in against your wishes isn't enough of a moral property to find intrinsically motivating. I mean, I hate to use such a heavy-handed example, but come on. And what about presupposition failure? The claim that moral beliefs are not true because they are neither true nor false. Again, having your head bashed in against your will only presupposes that you wouldn't appreciate that happening to you. Or maybe the morality of such an event would only be truth apt. That maybe there is some other kind of circumstance where you would enjoy having your head bashed in against your will. So as you can see, a lot of this can get quite ridiculous. Everyone has a line that if crossed will violate their permission. If one claims that they don't have any such line, then they must be Jesus Christ. But even if that was the case, you are still allowing the violation of your permission by your own free will. So there's no way around it. The major original reason for moral nihilism before it became absurdly misconstrued and taken to such extremes as to deny what's blatantly obvious, was to reject religious authoritarianism, that morality was ordained by an external force, in this case being God, and the truth of this God's morality was laid down by law in the form of dogmatic absolutism. And what could possibly be wrong with a morality that came straight from the very lips of God himself? Well, eventually, people with a little sense began to realize that these rules didn't come from a God at all. And that's not necessarily a problem but for that some of these rules were actually being used as more of a tool of manipulation and disempowerment and oppression utilized by those that wish to exercise control over others to their own ends. And it continues to this very day. That's why we still have factions that want to legislate your personal choices. They want to tell you what you can or cannot eat, drink, smoke, or introduce into your bloodstream. 
by rule of law and punishable by forcible containment. They want to tell you what is and what is not an acceptable receptacle to put your penis in. Can you imagine that? As if anyone else would know any better than you about what you want to put your penis in. Or that they know the more morally correct way to apply a penis. The more morally erect application. Can you see where this is going? You know who I'm talking about. The value junkies. Captain, rescue you against your will, man. Heroes and spandex that are here to force help upon you. And as damn well they should. After all, you don't know any better. They are going to help you. Oh, God damn it. They are going to help you. Even if it requires locking you in a cage for several years, they're going to help you. Damn it. And so some of you may be wondering, Sage, does that mean you are in support of controversial positions such as the right to die, alternate sexuality, the legalization of drugs, gambling, and prostitution? You know what? It doesn't even matter if I support it or not. Because it's none of my business. I'm not against any of those activities because they are victimless crimes. And it doesn't matter if they are responsible for influencing secondary crime or not. If that's the case, then let them crack down on that secondary crime. But the evidence for secondary crime due to the legalization of these activities in countries where they are currently legal doesn't support this assertion. So it's none of your business. And this is where nihilism becomes a useful tool in the fight against moral crusaders and value junkies that want to be invasive and intrusive in people's private beliefs and practices. And is that any surprise? Let's not forget that it used to be a whole lot worse. The church had every authority to murder you if you didn't adhere to its dominance. So moral nihilism was formed in response to this autocratic force that imposed itself under the guise of morality and ruled with unquestionable authority. Moral nihilism. There is no morality existing other than the morality that was created by man. And even this man-made morality doesn't even exist outside of the relative subjective existential utility of it. It's not an objective external force, but nor is it a void. It is immoral to use free will against the free will of another, unless said person is using their free will against the free will of another, or unless you are given permission to use your free will against the free will of another by the other. Any questions?